It takes a person of a certain character to get on stage in front of a few hundred people amused about his divorce. Uh, <laughs> but how do you feel about your divorce? Well, you know, um, Valentine's Day, it was kind of crushing. <laughs> Um, I can tell you that Bruce and I have a very good relationship. Another um, news agency in a recent article called it a bromance um, as compared to the other deal. Um, More and, the roses, I think. Yeah, the yeah. The, um, and, and so we still um, believe that the deal makes sense. Um, the logic of it is um, um, very powerful. And we will continue to pursue things that we can think of together and still be competitors. And maybe who knows what will happen over the next you know, couple of years. Right. But, but it's over. It's over. The, the deal is structured and the merger agreement have been terminated. And we are off to um, what is still a very engaged and interesting game. Right. So, so what is next for Aetna? So much focus and time was on that Humana deal. Uh, when you look big strategically, that obviously had, had huge importance for you. So what's next? Well, I think our strategy is still our strategy. So the whole acquisition logic was built around supporting our strategy and getting there quicker than we otherwise would if we had to build it organically. So we will still consider, to, we will still pursue getting to every market in the United States for Medicare Advantage. So when you look at Medicare Advantage with 11,000 people retiring every day, 3,500 of them only select Medicare Advantage. The rest go into traditional Medicare because there isn't a national footprint for Medicare Advantage and a portability across the country. So if you're a mobile senior, even though Medicare Advantage is half the price of most traditional plans when you add up all the things they need to buy, most people don't buy it because they're afraid of the mobility, the lack of mobility of Medicare Advantage plans. So there's still real big industrial logic around making that investment. So we'll do that organically. The second part is, is that we believe that the only way to truly disrupt the cost of health care, which is 80% of our premium, is to go into the homes and meet the social determinants that are now driving as much as 60% of the life expectancy of Americans. Right. You know, your zip code matters more than your genetic code right now as to your life expectancy. There are zip codes inside of Baltimore, zip codes inside of Chicago, where the average life expectancy is 16 to 20 years less than the zip codes around them. Okay, back to the deal for a moment. I, you bring up some really important uh, points there. Back to the deal for a moment. Do you ever say to yourself, sitting in the shower or on a bike or running, it's like, damn, we made, that was the wrong decision. We pressed too far. The government was never going to let that happen. And we just, it was the wrong choice uh, in the end. Big things never come from, if you don't take big risks, you don't make big things happen. Right. So how and big of a risk did you think it was when you started? Well, but I mean, the, the risk is, we thought, based on the mathematics of um, antitrust thinking, mm -hmm. you know, going zip code by zip code, that this was a deal that could be done with an appropriate remedy, which we thought we had. Um, but we didn't anticipate, nobody anticipated, the political dynamic of both the Obamacare or the ACA program deterioration, which was a big deal and had a huge impact on our deal, and the election we just had. And so through all of that, I mean, if you were able to look back and then look forward and say, well, if that was all going to happen, I'd probably sit at home by the fire instead right. of doing the deal, um, you know, you, you, you wouldn't have done it. All right, so but if we just sat there still for the whole time and said, we're not going to do this because we're afraid of what will happen two years from now, we would have got clobbered by our shareholders anyway. Right. So Anthem Cigna, seeing that uh, uh, deteriorate in some rather nasty uh, results mm -hmm. there, when you put those two deal failures together, what does that tell you about the future of healthcare and the limits that government's willing to set on sort of competition as, as it evolves? Well, I think... One of the things that I learned through the whole thing is that it's impossible to explain the business we're in. Because when you look at five big companies going to three, that is myopic and immature logic. Because, Why? because in most markets, our major competitors are Blue Cross Blue Shield plans that have anywhere from 50 to 70% of the market. Mm -hmm. So it's a local market phenomenon. And unless you're in a local market with some presence, you can't compete. And so we lose to Blue Cross Blue Shield than more, more than we do to each other. And so the whole idea is what's going on in the local marketplace with both the providers and the large plans that dictate the structure of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And you are irrelevant unless you have a presence. And there. do the Blues have an incumbent, politically favored 
uh, status in Washington that you view as unfair? No, I don't. You know, that's that's all part of the part of the deal. You know that going in, mm -hmm. and I think the idea is it was on us to explain it in a meaningful way and to keep people's attention long enough to explain it, and that just didn't happen. So the attention part or the both, logic? Yeah, both. Okay, right, the logic <laughs> and the attention, and it's just too complicated. 